There's a passage where the Buddha talks about the development of goodwill, and by implication all the other sublime attitudes, as a form of restraint. We don't usually think about it in those terms. We think of it more as a, an opening of the heart, letting all its natural goodness out. But then, of course, the Buddha never said anything about natural goodness. He said the mind is very changeable. It's capable of all kinds of things, and it can change so quickly that even saying in the flash of an eye is too slow. So what are we restraining as we develop goodwill? Well, basically, we're, if we have thoughts of ill will in the mind, they're going to come out in our actions. And so instead of just holding the ill will as you try to prevent it from coming out in your actions, you try to nip in the bud. If you're sitting here and things come up in your mind about something that someone did or someone else said, then it gets you really worked up. You need a, a way to restrain yourself. That's what goodwill is for. Similarly, the idea of wanting to do harm to somebody comes up, you need compassion. Again, both for yourself and for the other person. Resentment comes up. Somebody's good fortune, you feel that they got something you should have had. Or just you see that they've got some position that you don't think they deserve. Well, develop empathetic joy. And any aversion that comes up for anybody, the Buddha says, develop equanimity. They're all very interesting pairings, especially the Equanimity for aversion. We're usually told that goodwill is the antidote for anger. But sometimes there are cases where someone has done something and it's really hard to feel goodwill for them. But at the very least you say, okay, I'm just not going to get involved for the time being. And remember that everybody has their own karma. But there's another kind of restraint as well, and that's with do with remembering that you've done wrong to somebody, and you want to resolve not to do it again. This is where the Buddha, again, recommends developing all the Brahma-viharas as a way of maintaining that vow you've made to yourself for restraint. Because when you've wronged somebody else, it's, it's very easy to start thinking in terms of either you're a really bad person. And that gets you down. And then to get out of that mood, you start telling yourself, well, maybe the other person deserved what I, what I did. You don't want that either. You have to have goodwill for both sides. Goodwill for yourself means what? Thinking about what genuine happiness comes from and what you need to do in order to find it. And making the resolve, okay, you really do want to find that happiness. Goodwill for the other person, of course, means you don't want to harm them, and you don't want to get them to do harm either. And of course, they'll have their own free will to make choices, but to whatever extent you can have an influence, you want to have, make it a good influence. And remember, the, the goodwill is there for you. Even though you're directing it to somebody else, it's for the sake of your own skillfulness. Because as you train the mind, there are going to be a lot of things you're going to have to give up, habits you've developed over the years, ways of thinking, ways of speaking, ways of acting. You've got to exercise more restraint. One of the reflections that the Buddha has the monks think of every day is, now that I've changed my status, I have to change my, my activities. You look around, you see how the other monks are behaving, and you ask yourself, is, is that the way I behave? Or do I have some rough edges that I have to polish off, file down? And you learn to do this not in a way that you feel like you're going to hold yourself in and explode. You want to get to the root, i.e. your attitude, which is you want true happiness, and true happiness makes a lot of demands. 
It's not that we just simply follow our own nature and everything's going to be fine. There's a lot of things that the practice requires that we don't follow our habits, or don't follow our strong urges. Again, we can't think that the mind is naturally good and you can trust everything that comes out. The mind has all kinds of potentials inside. And just because something feels natural, feels normal, doesn't mean that it's going to be good for you. It's just what you've been accustoming yourself to. So whatever you have to give up, try to do it with an attitude of goodwill. Have some good humor about it as well. Learn to see the bad side of the habits you're having to abandon. So it doesn't seem like you're giving up anything essential or anything that you really would like to hold on to. Because happiness is not an easy thing. I mean, there are pleasures. There are very quick pleasures you can get, and they're very easy. But genuine happiness is something else. It requires training. And goodwill, after all, is a form of concentration, and that requires restraint. You don't let your mind wander off into other areas. If you do find some ill will creeping in, or the desire to do harm, or to see somebody being harmed, or resentment or aversion, you've got to look into it for the purpose of training yourself out of it. You don't just spread thoughts of, may all beings be happy, 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 happy. That may work for a few minutes, but it doesn't really get to the problem, which is that you're holding on to some sort of attitude, which is wrong view. I mean, wishing to see someone else suffer is not a right view of any kind of all. The whole purpose of the teaching is that people are suffering, but they don't have to suffer. In other words, the Buddha is saying they don't deserve to suffer, even though they've done bad in the past. That doesn't mean they deserve to suffer. Even if you've done good, excuse me, if you've done bad things in the past, you don't deserve to suffer. Everybody can change their ways. This is one of the basic propositions that the Buddha worked on. If people couldn't change their ways, he said there'd be no need to teach them, no reason to teach them. But people can. They can learn to be more skillful and drop unskillful things. And so that's the attitude you should have to everybody. If they're doing something really unskillful, okay, make the wish. May they learn how to stop that. And if you're in a position to have any influence over that person, okay, try to use it skillfully. If not, you just pose that as an attitude. Because the fact that the mind changes so easily means that you can't really trust it until you've reached at least the first level of awakening. It can always turn around very quickly. And so you've got to do whatever you can to make sure that you can learn to trust yourself. And one of the ways you do this is developing the restraint that comes from goodwill. You're not going to go into thoughts of ill will, or if Ill will, thoughts of ill will come up, you're going to deal with them. Try to root them out. Because if you let any ill will linger in your mind, it might come out in ways that you might not anticipate. It comes out at times of weakness. It comes out at times when you're feeling threatened. It comes out in times of fear. So you've got to learn how to defend yourself from unskillful behavior that would come at any of those times. So that even when you are feeling weak and threatened, you hold on to the idea, I want genuine happiness, which may require some sac sacrifices. And number one is you have to sacrifice anything you might do that would be unskillful to get out of a difficult situation. There are some difficult situations you have to learn how to accept because you can't think of any skillful way out. Okay, that's something you've got to accept. That's a form of restraint that's very difficult, but it's really important. One of the whole reasons the precepts are so simple 
is that they're easy to keep in mind. If they were very complex, you'd have to consult with the scholars. At times when you don't have any time to consult with scholars, you've got to make a decision right here, right now. And if you keep remembering, I'm not going to do anything that's going to harm myself, and I'm not going to do anything that harms others. And it's interesting, from the Buddhist point of view, harming yourself means things like killing, stealing, having illicit sex, any other breaking of any of the precepts. Harming others is getting them to do those things. In other words, you treat people not simply as objects of your actions. They're agents, too. They have free will, too. So you don't want to influence their choices in a bad way, because that's what's going to create suffering for them down the line. All this is very basic, but it's good to remember the basics every now and then. Because it's very easy to cover up the basics with lots of rhetoric, and it sounds very high and very noble. Justified war, justified stealing, justified illicit sex. I mean, the mind can create excuses for all kinds of things and make it very sound very advanced and very spiritual, but it's not. Keep the basics in mind and try to keep your mind at a basic level, and it's hard to go wrong. So we don't pretend that we're all innately good or that we're all one. Each of us has an element of free will that we have to respect, and each of us can do all kinds of things. Now, in that possibility, you can see both danger and potential, a potential for good. So we develop goodwill as a type of restraint, because it gets the mind thinking in the right terms. In terms of the causes and effects of happiness, and in the case of Resentment, in other words, the, the attitude that empathetic joy is supposed to overcome. The teacher says there's nothing to resent in the world, nothing worth resenting. We shouldn't see other people's good fortune as making anything less of us, because we're not here to compete. We're here to work on our own unskillful habits and develop whatever skillful qualities we can. So resentment doesn't make any sense at all. When you can think in those terms, you can trust yourself a lot more. <laughs>